Welcome to Series 39, everyone. This series is already shaping up to be a doozy, but I am thoroughly and personally excited to share it all with you. We are covering the game I've been working on for three and a half years now, Chimera. Amr Amrez joins me as a guest on this episode, and in the interest of me not covering my own game, we have invited Senda of Pandas Talking Games, she's a super geek, and Gnome Stew fame, to join Amelia as the co-host. It's a really great dynamic, and we get into some really fantastic world building this episode. But before we get to all of that, some announcements. First up, if you like what you hear this episode and series or have liked what you've heard me talk about for years now and want to get a copy of Chimera for yourself to try out, you can now gain access to the public playtest edition on itch.io or itch.io depending on how you pronounce that. If you head to play.chimera.games, you will find a public playtest version of the latest iteration of the game. You'll get access to the Google Sheets character sheets, um, along with a quick start guide, the three different primary genre modules for fantasy, magical girls, and superheroes, as well as three micro genre modules for adding mystery, horror, or musical fun to Chimera, or almost any other PBTA game with very little work. It's a fully playable game and is the culmination of over three years of hard work, so I really hope you'll go check it out and let us know what you think. Also, we are looking for feedback on Chimera, so if you can go there and leave some feedback after playing it, you can actually help shape the future of Chimera and potentially squash some bugs to help us have the best version possible when it comes time for the full release. I don't think we have any other announcements for right now. This other one was a pretty big one. So head on over to play.chimera.games after listening to the episode and get your very own copy. We will see you right back here after the show for the call to action. Until then, enjoy the show. Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia. In this episode, my guest co-host Senda and I welcome Amar Amaraz and Brian Bolter, what? designers of the game we're going to be covering today, Chimera, a Powered by the Apocalypse game that plays with blending multiple genres together. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're excited you're here. Ryan, thanks for showing up. More importantly, Amr. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm here. Can, you, can you all hear me? <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Okay, good, cool. Good. You're going to have to deal with this voice for the next three hours. Hello. I know. <laughs> hey. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, our normal host dynamics are all mixed up for this series because uh, Ryan doesn't get to host an episode about his own game. That would not be okay. <laughs> Um, however, since we started making this podcast, Ryan has been talking about developing this game, and it's finally time, so we have welcomed Senda to be a guest host with me so that we can quiz Ryan um, and Emma about their game. The best part. Senda, you haven't been on with us since Series 7 when we talked about Headspace. It's yes. been a really long time. 32 series is, is a while um, yeah. <laughs> yeah a while in case you wanted to feel old it's been 32 oh series is, is. It's is. Uh, <laughs> what sort of things have you been up to in the meantime well um gosh there's been this pandemic going on so i have to admit to you i, I heard haven't, about that right like i haven't really been expanding <laughs> on what i do but <laughs> 
You can still find me on uh, Pandas Talking Games, the podcast, which is at Pandas Talk Games on Twitter. Um, you can still find me writing articles for Gnome Stew. Um, and those are pretty much the main places. And you can track me down on Twitter. It's at Idella Mithland, which I'm expecting Ryan to now mock me, is I-D-E-L-L-A-M-I-T-H-L-Y-N-N-D. Just spell it out real Put it in the show notes. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for doing this with us. I'm really excited that we get to be co-hosts for once. I'm We've never excited. gotten to like co-host anything before. And I'm so thrilled about this. <laughs> we should do this more often. <laughs> we should. Hey, want to start a podcast? No. As long as no, I don't have to I, edit it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Before we dive into the game, I guess, Ryan, we will let you introduce yourself to our audience. Mm. Tell us about yourself and what you've been working on. <laughs> I, I think we should let uh, Amr go first. Uh, oh, Because okay. uh, Amr has not been on the show yet. Yes. Good. Tell us, tell us, Amr. <laughs> I, I believe that is my cue. Hello. Well, it's not editing. We know that. <laughs> I don't do editing, but I do way too much other things. Hi, I'm Amr Amaraz. Uh, I do podcasting, writing, streaming, game design, crying, you know, all the healthy parts of a work-life balance. Uh, <laughs> by, my day job is software engineering, and that's where a lot of my background comes from, computer engineering, robotics, and stuff. But here, I do a lot of freelance game design. I've been doing a lot of writing projects that I'm... For all different Kickstarters and folks, I've been doing a lot more streams over on Utopia and on Lark Network with Super Splash of Color. Yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, this small little project on the side that's not much deep deal, <laughs> but you know, Chimera. Yeah, that one. It's, it's a, a fun thing. game. It's a thing. Well, yeah. I'm excited to make characters in it, but so how about now, Ryan? Now okay. will you tell us some information? I, about, okay, what are you I working could... on? Where can people find you? <laughs> well, it's certainly not this podcast. Anymore. I know. Goodness gracious. Um, That's it. I'm I taking think over. I, I think I lost my position here. I don't know what's going on. Uh, no, it's you fine. You can still uh, edit, though. <laughs> yeah, you can still edit. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would, too. Um, so, yeah, Ryan Bolter. Uh I am doing all sorts of things outside of character creation cast. The biggest thing is Chimera, uh, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, I've also been streaming uh, a Chimera live stream campaign um, over the last couple of months or so. And we are approaching our last two episodes, which should be uh, near the end of May. And then probably our finale uh, very, very beginning of next month, uh, every other Friday, uh, give or take. So uh, you can catch me at Lord Neptune on Twitter or find Chimera at Chimera RPG on Twitter. And you can follow uh, when those things are going to be happening. Um, I also do editing and sound design for A Horror Borealis. I do dialogue editing for The Broadswords. Um I, I probably do other things I can't remember. So that there you go. Everyone should just make you edit all the things. Is no. what I'm hearing. That's what I just <laughs> yes. I have so little time. Hey, hey, I have Ryan, so you little time. Edit more podcasts. Hey, I've got so many ideas. Let's let's release uh, Chimera and then we can talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and actually talk about this game now. Like, we're going to stop talking about editing. Sure. We're going to talk about what this game is all about. What's in a game? Normally, we ask about the setting of the game. But Chimera is special, and it's brand new, and mixes all kinds of genres around the PBTA framework. So can you tell us a little bit about your elevator pitch for the game? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to cover this one, Amr? You you go ahead first because I don't have good pitch. I have joke pitches. I think you were like I've never actually figured out an actual proper pitch for this game, so I really want to hear yours. Okay. Well, let's see if I can uh, piece it all together, uh, just like Chimera pieces uh, worlds together. Whoa. Um So basically, Chimera is a, uh, a pseudo modular powered by the apocalypse game where you blend together multiple genre modules to create a very unique world. And then you mix together two different playbooks to create a very unique character to play within those worlds. That's the gist of it. Um, each, each genre has its own tropes that it kind of allows you to play with if you select those tropes. And uh, each character type, uh, we call them archetypes, 
uh, has its own story that is trying to tell. So when you blend two archetypes together, you get to figure out how those two stories meld into one character story, which is really fun. Very cool. Oh, I I really like the word that you used, pseudo modular, and I'm probably yeah. going to ask you about that again later because what a really <laughs> cool way to describe how you're taking the things and blending them together. But that's fancy. My pitch is so much less fancy than that. Do you oh, want to hear your yeah, pitch? Yeah, do you want to give us you your saying that you have to say, you have to tell me yours? Yeah. Chimera is a game born out of spite for the concept that PBTA games must be very genre specific. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I feel like that's also a good I mean, pitch. that's also true, but on the other <laughs> hand... It tells you so it, much less about the game itself. Mm -hmm. But it also, like, it feels inaccurate because I don't know that Ryan has ever done anything born out of spite. <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't imagine, like, Ryan being like, done hate you PBTA so much I'm gonna just <laughs> make my own game then <laughs> I think it's more challenging the concept that the, the popular conception that PBTA games are better because it generally is true with PBTA design better when they are designed for specific things like some of our everyone's favorite PBTA games even the ones that have been covered on this show do very targeted genres and they do That's those targeted true. genres well and they play repeatedly well within those targeted genres uh and then with some work, you can stretch them outside of their bounds, but they tend to work best within the original containers they're built for. Chimera tries to take those containers and provide ways to play with them in interesting ways so that you're not as constrained to one container for one game. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I know we did at one point have like a like sort of soft block on doing any more pbta games mm -hmm. for a while because there are so many and they're different enough from each other because like you said they are so genre specific mm -hmm. um and they do those things really well but i i wonder though if that's why people make so many of them is that like they're so niche like each one is so niche um mm -hmm. well, and so I, I think it'll be interesting to see how you I, I, I want to see how you made a game that blends genres, not just a game trying to, like, be 12 genres. You know, like, mm -hmm. I want to see how you didn't make 12 games. You made one game that blends those things. Well, from a certain point of view, it is 12 games that we kind of smushed together. The books that you had to <laughs> yep. make and, like, we, that kind of stuff, for each sure. Each genre is functionally a full game, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's too much work. <laughs> I'm tired already. It's intense. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds really neat, though, because it, it's, um, I think, I think in, in complete opposite of what you actually said, Amir, it sounds to me like this is almost a love letter to how PBTA works with genre emulation to make it the thing that can merge genres, which mm -hmm. is really cool. But I like the way that you said it better. <laughs> well, 100%. I mean, like, PBTA is one of my preferred game systems. I play a lot in it. I've designed a lot in it. I've tweeted about the math of it. I've mm -hmm. dreamed about it. Yes. It haunts me in my nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, it, and it's a system that I feel really comfortable working with. It's one of those systems that I'm most able to look at a game for and envision how it plays out more so than any other system just yeah. because of how much i've done with it and recognizing the limitations of the things you love and like recognizing how to play with those and warp those is i think a really useful thing to be able to do yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah I'm that's definitely a thing i've noticed as i started doing some design stuff is that like being so deep in a system that you notice all of the places where it doesn't quite work where like you're you love it to death. You love it so much that you know everything about it. But, like, your eyes are still open to the places where it, it doesn't quite click. And I think that gives you the chance to be a really good designer in that system to say, how can I fix those things that don't mm -hmm. work? Or how can we bend this model to do something new that you mm -hmm. know, right. hasn't done with it before? Um, which is the thing that I actually love seeing in a lot of PBTA games because... It's just cool. And like people mm -hmm. have gone so many directions with them. And I think this one is a direction we haven't seen before, which is let's write 12 games and see how you can make them work together instead of let's strip even more rules out so that you just pass things around or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, right. So that's really, it's really neat. Anyway, speaking of like how this game actually works and how you're going to make everything go together, what are the tools that you need to sit down at the table and actually play this particular game? 
what stuff do you have to have on hand? If you say friends, so help me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play games with friends. I play games with four bitter rivals to prove who of us is the best role player. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have to win. We might have been friends when we started, but by the time we're done. <laughs> you have to win role playing games. That's what we're all yep. about here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm going to reframe our pitch for Chimera. Chimera is a role playing game designed so that you can finally win at role playing games. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, no, but the serious answer is, and there, Ryan actually probably will have a more like holistic answer, but in terms of pieces besides the usual PBTA stuff like playbooks and basic moves and the like, the core component that differentiates it from just grabbing what you need for a normal PBTA game and going is the dice. Mm -hmm. It isn't just 2d6 for the system. Ooh. Yes. Uh, we used Chimera dice, uh, which we're going to see more of and we do the character creation, but essentially you're going to need dice from d4 to d10s and 12s. Uh, and your okay, well, now you've lost me. Yeah. yeah. Am I, gonna... I don't know if we're using D12s yet. Uh, we're, we're back and forth on whether or not we're going to yeah. step into D12s or not. But, at the very um, least, they don't come up in character creation. Yeah, at the very least, uh, yeah, D4s through uh, D10s, and two of them each uh, will be just perfect for any combination that you can make. Because you're still rolling two dice. Host fail. My dice are in the other room. <laughs> you don't need them. Yeah, actually, I was going to grab mine too. Yeah, like you don't right need them door. for character creation. Oh, okay, cool. we, we just assign them for character <laughs> yeah. creation, but okay. you need them during play. Gotcha. Yeah. Neat. Mm -hmm. The only other thing you need to play the game is the specific genres you're going to be using during that yeah. session. Right now, there are only three genres and three micro genres that are going to be available for people's use. Uh, and you can choose which ones of those you're going to bring. Eventually, our hope is that this is a game that not only has the genres that we will write, but more and more people will pick it up and write their own genres and do mm -hmm. their own cool things with them. And so there will be, hopefully, a lot of genres. And obviously, you can't show up with 20 different PBTA games and 20 different genres to the table. So you'd only be bringing the specific materials for the genres your group agreed to play. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's what benefits from a, uh, a session zero, um, or at least a discussion prior to a session zero about what genres your group is going to be interested in, uh, because you don't want to be printing all the playbooks if you are only going to be using uh, two thirds of them or, you know, whatever, uh, yeah. depending on where we are in picking up how many major genres there are for Chimera. But obviously the completionist in you is going to want to buy all of the like supplements oh, as yeah. they come out and people write them so that you could have them on your shelf. Absolutely. <laughs> or at least have them like in your you know, or something. Mm -hmm. You don't need to print them all out. Yeah. Like you don't have to yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> print out a hundred playbooks, but like. In your digital no. library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Right. Well, and with the beauty of, you know, technology these days too, you can, you can write on PDFs and you can, mm -hmm. you know, like. I've been learning that with my fancy new iPad. I can just oh, yeah. color on my PDF. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's an advertisement for iPad. Uh, <laughs> it does stuff. We've kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but one of the questions we always ask here is what kinds of stories and themes is this game meant to explore? Now, I... mixing genres kind of complicates that. Yeah. The answer is, like, I don't know, a bunch of them, as many as we have written so yeah. far? Or It's it's an interesting question because um, it, it, de it really depends on what genres you include, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, the, the main genres that we have uh, right now are superhero, uh, fantasy, and magical girl, mm -hmm. okay? So those are the three that we're going to be kind of working with uh, today, and those are the three that we're going to be releasing with it that have characters for them. So if you're blending superhero and fantasy, then you're you're blending some of the, the tropes from fantasy, depending on what you pick for your world. And you're blending some of the tropes from superheroes. And those are the types of stories you're going to have like a over the top superhero, uh, maybe comic booky feel with like this grand adventure feel. Sure. as well but you throw magical girls into the mix and now you're also having like this coming of age sort of story built into this thing and and the mundane life is now more important mm -hmm. probably than just fantasy or just superheroes by themselves based on kind of understanding what types of stories you're telling then um what what do you see characters doing in this game which again is probably a little bit dependent on which genres you actually end up 
playing with when you set this up. But mm -hmm. like, you know, just using the three that you have right now, kind of as a, a starting point examples, what do you see characters doing? Like, Ryan, go ahead and answer. Then I'll, I can answer both questions at once. Oh, there you uh, go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so characters, um, they generally right now are heroes uh, in the game and they do what is kind of expected in the genres that you're going to be including. So superheroes are going to save people. Uh, fantasy characters are probably going to go on an adventure and magical girls are going to uh, struggle between their mundane lives and their heroic lives. And it's probably going to be a really over the top villain of sorts that you're going to be fighting when you throw magical girls into the mix. <laughs> um, and it might get a little goofy as well, uh, which I've, I've noticed quite a lot. Um, but really your, your characters are extremely dependent on the genres included and what archetypes that you choose, because every single archetype tells a story. It has story beats kind of built into it, like traditional PBTA games. Most of the playbooks in like your monster hearts or your masks tell a story, uh, or, or at least the moves will say you're, you're kind of going towards this sort of story for this character type. And when you blend that together with another archetype, now you've got these two stories that at first might not seem that they could stick together. But when you're creating your character, they kind of start melding in really interesting ways that uh, sometimes are unexpected uh, to both the player and the GM. So it's really interesting uh, because the story comes from the characters and a group of these blended characters just tells a really interesting and wild story from what I've seen. Now that Ryan has given the uh, practical answer, I'm going to give the uh, hoity-toity theory answer. I'm <laughs> um, so but basically, excited. One of, one, one of my like strongest personal beliefs and perspectives when it comes to designing things is that Every single RPG is a generic RPG, and, and there is no such thing as a generic RPG. The, basically, you can take the mechanics of any game and use them generally to tell other stories, but also mechanics inherently have assumptions baked into them. They have directions, stories, and the like. Even generic mm -hmm. systems do that. The difference between a system like Fate and GURPS and Genesis is what types of stories they are more equipped to tell or the types of experiences of play they're delivered they're used to delivering. Fate tends to lean more simulationist and is more about playing with the aspects. Genesis leads to more epic heroic stories. GURPS is a lot more crunchy and a little bit more flexible as a result, but can also be a little bit more gritty for the usual part, right? So on and so forth. Um, Chimera being a generic system, quote unquote, because it's meant to allow you to do all sorts of things, as long as you have the modules for them, needs to be have some sort of core binding to it. And as far as I can tell so far, and hey, just because I'm good at identifying doesn't mean I'm great at adding them to my own games. Uh, <laughs> Chimera focuses on what I personally perceive as one of PBTA's strongest strengths, which is things about relationships, stories and games about relationships and interactions between people. PBTA is really good at guiding towards play that is about connection, about conflict between two people or connections and strength and upholding two people together, etc., etc. And that's why, like most popular PBTA games, Passion de la Passionis, a game about telenovela, romance, drama, masks, a game about identity, finding your belonging, your place. Uh, thirsty Sword Lesbians. Need so I say good. more? <laughs> uh, that was so good. <laughs> belonging Outside Belonging and a lot of the No Dice No Master games. All about relationships, mm -hmm. fitting in, etc. And so Chimera allows you to tell any story as long as the focus is towards relationships and the like. Or at least it will excel. You could do any story with it because you can do any story with any RPG if you put your mind to it. But that's where the mechanics of the game bind you to the strongest, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what characters do is whatever they want to do when it comes to having these relationships, whatever their relationships take them, whether that's you as an adventuring party always having one another's back, you fighting up monsters like you do in a standard fantasy story, or maybe the monsters you have to deal with are personal demons or familial struggles or the like. And 
one of the goals with Chimera and one that we are constantly working towards with each iteration is making sure that the playbooks and the moves are flexible enough to allow those different types of stories because fantasy isn't really one type of story. Superheroes, you ask me, I tell you I'm telling a superhero story. My question is going to be, okay, is this MCU or MCU Netflix? Is this Watchmen? Is this Doom Patrol? Is this Jack? Um, is this Zack Snyder's Justice League? And if it is, please leave. Um, et cetera. <laughs> right? You got to know what story you're telling. Yeah. Um, and so we want to allow it to tell various superhero stories. And maybe someone might come along later and make a modification or a micro genre, even the full genre, to tell a very specific superhero story. Mm. But yeah, that's the answer. Is there a Pokemon? module coming at some point because my kids are super obsessed with pokemon right now and i feel like that's a genre that we need is small children going off on adventures with large scary animals i mean okay with with armor involved with armor involved there there has to be well i'm wondering like where are we at with this is it going to be ready in time for the kickstarter (laughs) Dear audience, you cannot see our videos right now. But currently, <laughs> if you see my stream, you generally know what I'm dressed like, and that is I'm wearing a Lucario hoodie, and on the bed behind me, there are not one, but two Poplios, one large one hugging a smaller one. We we all got to see it, and we loved yeah. it. It's <laughs> great. I'm surprised there's actually not any, because I'm not out in my living room. There's like five Pokemon stuffed animals out in the living room <laughs> in various places right now, because we're just really into Pokemon right now, so... I'm just wondering if small children hunting monsters is a thing that's coming. It might be. It and might any, very well be. Literally any genre uh, can be emulated in Chimera. Um, it, we put together kind of a framework, um, and we can kind of go over that a little bit uh, when we talk about micro genres. Uh, there's a there's a little bit of a framework of what genres add when you add them into a game. Um, and, uh, you can actually, uh, even with like the, if you have a campaign say going right now and it's like 20, I wanted to say episodes sessions <laughs> in, um, you can, you can sl- it might you can be slot recording, in micro, you know. <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, you can slot in a micro mod, uh, micro genre module for a session or two and then take it out. And for that session or two. It's your musical episode. It's your horror episode. It's your Pokemon episode. Or you could have it for the whole campaign as this is just another augmentation of the tropes that we're playing with during our campaign. So it's a full horror campaign from start to finish, which just has the module tagged into it. So why are these the three genres that you started with? Why is it fantasy superheroes and magical girls. I'm not, I'm not even going to say why magical girls. That's a stupid question. <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, uh, hey, hey, Lord Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, honestly, I have to blame Senda for this one. Oops. Um So, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I was listening to Pandas Talking Games uh, back in 2017. Oh my gosh. Um, and <laughs> way back when. Way back when. There was, there was an, there was an episode, um, that got I don't remember the episode. I don't remember what you were talking about. Uh, but I remember you said something specifically that made my brain go, ooh, maybe I can blend fantasy and superheroes together. Um, and, and maybe that's something. And uh this gets into a little bit of the history of the game, which is coming up soon, but uh it basically said, What if I take the Palladium Heroes Unlimited superpowers? And translate them into D and D mechanics. <laughs> no, fifteen minutes into that, I said no, thank you. No, there's a, there has to be a better way. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about that, I know very little about Palladium except what I've heard from you. Yeah, everything about that hurts my soul. Yeah. It's so I mean, it was so bad. I'm I mean, like I know Palladium very like, well. What if we took a cool genre from like a bad game and put it into a game that's like. Just okay. Yeah. Oh, no. Don't insult the Palladium <laughs> games in front of Ryan, Amelia. <laughs> like, oh, no. No. Knows. I insult them myself, so it's okay. fine. Uh, so so that basically turned into there's got to be a better way. And then 
um, I, I just found PBTA um, through podcasts. I can't remember which one sparked the idea to utilize that. But then I just uh, started listening to things like uh, Plus One Forward, uh, other podcasts that covered kind of the uh, PBTA uh, theory and whatnot. And from there, that, that kind of built into what it is today. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So it all started with Senda. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm, I feel like I don't, and I don't remember because here's the other, here's the other fun thing about podcasting. I don't remember what I said like a week after I said it, let mm-hmm. alone like five years ago. I recorded it, so right. I wouldn't have I to remember, have to remember it. it. Exactly. But I know that we did an episode about genre blending specifically. So like, it sort of sounds yeah. vaguely familiar. <laughs> and that might've been where it came from, right? Yeah, Maybe. It's, I, but I, mean, I, can't, I, I can't remember if like that was... That one is a strong possibility, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, 2017 was a lifetime ago. It's, it really it was. So long ago. It really was. <sighs> so, what would you say is unique about Chimera? So, I mean, beyond everything we've already discussed, um, I think it's two things. One, it's the ability to have, if you like PBTA system mechanics and structure... It's the ability to mold that to the types of stories you want to tell Mm -hmm. um, in a way similar to what other generic systems offer. Uh, It's the explicit encouraging to blend genres together, which I think a lot of people do already, but not a lot of things explicitly structure that for you, Mm -hmm. except for like certain pre-agreed upon like genre blending, like Wild West and Weird. Like Weird West is a pretty common genre as a result. It's a pretty neat genre. Um, yeah, but that's prepackaged, right? But that's a prepackaged yeah. because people are used to that combination. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With more, more and more modules, you could get some truly weird combinations here that might not be super you get common. Weird but magical might be girls. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was um, thinking the, Western magical girls. I went to different Western magical oh, girls. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, there you go. Cowboy boots and fringe with transformations. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you like your cowboy alter ego? Uh, instead of a tiny, adorable cat, you have your horse Gosh. who tells you what to do. Oh. <laughs> I would yes. play this game. So, like, I'm not <laughs> super into magical girls, but I would play this game. I have like a soft spot for Westerns. Like, mm-hmm. I grew up with a, gar- a grandpa that was like super into cowboy movies. Like, I would. Oh, oh man, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I'm having visions of like the westernized magical girl outfit and like walking into town while the tumbleweed blows by. Mm-hmm. We could go down this path. I'm so sorry, uh, Amir. Please finish this. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm just writing notes in my brain. <laughs> yeah, uh, please. But the, but the second thing, which is, uh, which I think is neat about this, is I don't think anything we are writing here for Chimera is limited to Chimera. One of my goal, especially with the micro genres, is that you could take them and plop them into your other games. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to turn your session of another PBTA game into a mystery game for a session, you could take the micro genre from Chimera because a lot of our moves aren't tied to specific stats and just pull them into your game. If your game has specific stat types to moves, you could say, okay, this move is explicitly tied to the stat. Or you could do it like we do it in Chimera and say, choose the stat that fits the approach you're taking. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really neat because it is a game that doesn't exist just in conversation with itself, but could help augment your experience with other games that you mm-hmm. enjoy. That is, I yeah, love it, games that focus on approaches rather than like um, just things being tied to a stat. Mm-hmm. Like being focused on like how are you going about doing this thing rather than just I'm doing the thing. Yeah, and and honestly, you can you can take the major uh, genre modules as well and strip out all the characters. Uh, forget about the basic moves and just use the stuff that also comes with the micro genre modules and put those into uh, other PBT games as well. Which is brilliant because being able to make your other games more expandable is fantastic. I I was actually just thinking about this earlier and y'all probably hear this on Pandas later. So here's your preview for what I'm recording tonight. Um, (laughs) There's this funny thing that happens for me and I don't know if it happens for other people too, but I, I think that it's um, pretty typical of people who play a lot of small book indie games. Um, I tend to play a game once and have that experience. And I and even if like they're, they're good games, right? Like I really enjoy playing them, but then I've had the experience and I'm not necessarily going to go back and play that game again, right? Because I've had that experience mm-hmm. and um, 
kind of like with a movie, if I enjoyed the movie, but it wasn't like my favorite movie in the entire world. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. I go back and watch it a lot, right? But the idea of either specifically for Chimera or even just for other games, being able to take something and change it a little bit so that the experience changes is really interesting to me because you suddenly opened up kind of a a, a whole new like replayability window for me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like where I might be more interested in going back and replaying a game that I have already played, um, maybe a short campaign of or something along those lines, if I can tweak like the direction of it a little bit and have something Mm -hmm. like that micro genre to kind of tack into it to really change the feeling of it. um, That's fascinating to me. I think that's Yeah, especially for those smaller games that do have, you know, like we talked about with a lot of PBTA that have that like very niche genre and like they're meant to evoke like specific feelings and specific types of stories that like, you know, even if you have different characters and you're playing with different friends, you tend to kind of replay some of the same tropes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just because that's what the game is meant to do. And it does those things really well. But yeah, I do think that that offers a lot of opportunity to replay some of those things if you can tweak some of those stories and come out with something much more um much different than what you started with the first time Mm -hmm. yeah i'm super fascinated in that um but uh we started to go down this path a little bit earlier and i am excited to hear more about it since i am apparently (laughs) involved in it in more ways than i knew (laughs) Um, (laughs) can you tell us more about the actual history of how you started writing Chimera. So like there was the seed of the idea Mm -hmm. in the Pandas Talking Games and then it's like and then it wasn't a D&D game and it wasn't a D&D game which is yeah. great idea good cool. good idea love yep. that yeah. <laughs> a plus um, <laughs> so where did you go from there once you figured out it was powered by mm-hmm. the apocalypse so once I figured out it was powered by the apocalypse I did a bunch of research and uh, the idea kind of came to fruition I think it was September in 2017 and on a just fevered uh, run of game design of like throw things at it and see what sticks, um, I put it all together into a playable version uh, by a catacon in November, uh, which is at the beginning of November. Wow. <laughs> um, it was it was uh, fantasy and superheroes at first. Uh, because that's the original idea that I had. It didn't have magical girls at this point. And it was garbage. Uh, but the uh, the whole genre blending and world building that came out of that was the 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 core feel that we wanted, right? Uh, Amr wasn't a part of the project at this point. Um, and the my original play testers, uh, which I- included uh, Richard Kreutz Landry uh, of the Descent into Midnight fame, um, they created this fantasy superhero world that was uh, just really interesting. It had this supervillain that was uh, polar bear themed, I guess, oh, and it. and they were punching dire polar bears around with like uh, magic tech uh power armor and it was just it was wild and the the rules of the system were just total garbage because i was basically doing okay i need hit points i need armor points i need weapon damage i need armor soak i need all this yeah like halfway through it you're gonna fall asleep trying to figure out what i was doing back that then. sounds like math ryan and you know how i feel <laughs> <laughs> well see uh amar and i are both uh math people and uh amar more than myself but uh this was too much it, it was horrible you had to look up charts to see how much damage yeah. you did in it. And then the second play test, which was the following day, we threw all that math out and it felt better. Uh, the funny story is, is I've never played or GM'd a Powered by the Apocalypse game before playing the first alpha of Chimera, which wow. I GM'd. It's a really different Bold. experience when you haven't run a game like that before, right? <laughs> I've never, I, I had no base. Yeah. I came from Palladium. Yeah. I came from the the <laughs> age which of which is all numbers. Yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. not how it works. I came from the nineties like mentality of role playing and uh it it opened my brain, uh so to speak, uh to 
this possibility of role playing that I never knew existed before. And once that clicked, I said, oh, so much needs to change. But the feedback that I got is this genre blendings got legs run with it. Yeah. So that's what that's what I did. And then um, in 2019, right at the beginning, I was like, I can't do this myself. I, I had been talking on the character creation cast discord um, about different game design ideas I was throwing out there. And Amr was one of the ones that uh, threw threw their their hat into the ring in terms of helping and whatnot. And I said, I, I need some help. Who, who is there anybody that would be willing to and armor stepped up yeah i do remember point. you you telling me when you asked them to like help and you were like it's gonna be okay now <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you were like i got armor to help and i was like great so I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm, i can gonna... keep you in line <laughs> <laughs> i just i came here to add more chaos and add more work to this idea but I'm going to flash this back in time to 2017 yes. again. Uh, when you were still so in I high st- school. No. <laughs> no, no. My freshman year of college, I started playing Pathfinder. I started playing Pathfinder okay. with some friends as a GM. That was my first ever TTRPG. I GM'd about three different campaigns of Pathfinder uh, that lasted from one session to six months mm-hmm. due to various just game-related reasons and also life mm-hmm. because we were college students. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, and all that entails. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then I found podcasts i joined the one shot network discord started interacting with more people playing more games and then character creation cast this weird show that i've never heard of and uh, i don't know what we're talking about joined the network i never heard of it either Uh, (laughs) i never heard of it either um but i that got really interested because it was another way to learn about more systems back at the time when i was still trying to discover new systems and didn't know how to do it as well by myself so i started listening to character creation cast joined the discord and that's where i heard about chimera from ryan and for a good while before I was on, I Brian would talk about Chimera a lot in that Discord, and we would talk about ideas. And uh, I was originally going to play test it at Catacon 2018, mm-hmm. but then flights happened. Yeah, your uh, flight was delayed. Test. Was that the one you yep. were like, you were like there for like a day or something? Your flight was like super late and like. I that one was the worst one. You had like lunch one, and then you left again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like uh, that wasn't that one, but okay. that one I did. I did basically was meant to arrive like. Either Thursday evening or Friday morning, I ended up arriving Friday at like close to oh, midnight. Uh, yeah. So, but anyways, kept talking to Ryan, met Ryan there. We interacted at other cons. We kept interacting through discords. We kept talking about that. And that's when I was brought on. Mm-hmm. And since then, it has been two years of throwing everything out and starting over again. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we stripped pretty much every genre except for Magical Girls. Uh, and even even yeah. that we tweaked quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, somehow I got Magical Girls uh, right enough uh, on on the first couple of iterations. I think it's mostly because Magical Girl as a genre defines its characters by tropes and archetypes for the most part, right? Like it, it's same like with Sentai and stuff where the colors, the symbolisms mean important things that you're supposed to immediately no. Whereas with fantasy and superheroes, you there was a lot of baggage of old games in that. I could see D and D baggage in the fantasy classes. I could see Palladium baggage in the superhero classes. Mm-hmm. In and the biggest shift that happened is that we moved from strict classes like cleric, barbarian, druid, bard, to categories of classes, archetypes of stories, which PBTA does better. Like uh the one that got pulled out of the barbarian isn't in the current playtest, but we took the barbarian and turned it into the possessed, which is just about someone who is possessed either by something magical or their anger or etc. and fights with that strength. So that could be a barbarian and that has a lot of the same mechanics, but it also allows telling different types of stories. We did that with all the other classes as well. And so a lot of the moves were taken and repurposed, but we rearranged and a lot of classes ended up with moves from, or a lot of playbooks ended up with a lot of moves from three or four different classes. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And some new ones. Yeah. It, it was it was fun when Amr was like, all right, I'm going to do the same thing I did to fantasy to superheroes in my... And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we threw out Be basically gentle. all the playbooks and like, okay, here's some moves that worked and here's some that didn't. And then we restructured everything. And I'm like, yes, this works so yeah. much better. Sometimes I think it makes a really big difference to have someone um, with fresher eyes when you've been 
in a project in over your head on a project for mm-hmm. a long time <laughs> to have someone yeah. um, who can see the horizon more clearly than you like come in and be able to yeah i think there's something to be said like for having a design partner to begin with somebody to say like i agree i don't design um, alone like pretty much ever um, <laughs> so you're not making any sense yeah um, but yeah i think also probably to have somebody come in from like outside and look at it mm-hmm. and you know because like i know i'm on, working on something right now that's just totally stalled out and it's like if we had somebody else look at it like they might look at it and be like oh here's exactly where you went wrong rather mm-hmm. than us spending the last like six months just going this isn't working <laughs> i have to ask something so this is just based on my design experience because I, as i just said i don't i pretty much always design with the same person so like we mm-hmm. co-design pretty much everything but like Right. I tend to be an under designer where I'm like, I don't know, don't put rules around that. Just make it fluffy and they can say words. And he tends to be <laughs> um, an over designer where he's like, let us put all of the rules in and then we'll take them out when we discover that we don't need them. So which one of you <laughs> is the over designer? <laughs> which one of you is the under designer? Or do you mix and match and share those bits? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> it I, might not apply at all. I, I just think it's a cool way I, to think about it. I want I want to say that we mix and match cool. pretty yeah. pretty well. Uh we kind of uh bounce back and forth with each other uh a lot and uh I know when when one of us is stuck the other one's usually like okay, well let's do this and then it works. Um and and there's a lot of times that we talk out loud with each other and it just starts clicking mm-hmm. after a bit. Um, I I don't I don't know if we like go over designy or under designy at all. I don't think it is physically possible to over design when we are designing three games at once. Functionally, <laughs> just any work we do is just the amount of work we must do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. That's We're, fair. Our our, there, there our is game no design is like a wizard. Uh, it's designed as much as it needs to be. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> never um, more, never less. Never more, never less. I think, but yeah, I think generally, like the dynamic is like if one of us starts an idea, the other person will come in with the fresh eyes to help refine or say, "Oh no, it's mm-hmm. good as is," or vice yeah. versa. Yeah, right. Um, I feel like that's really so important. Like, one one of the things we did for this public play test set we're releasing is we needed to change up some of the signature moves for some of the playbooks. And so Ryan started on that because I was going through changing meds and it was just hard for me to get work done. And despite Monty tell, I just couldn't because mm-hmm. they just messed up with everything. Mm-hmm. And Ryan started working on that, got figured out the ones we needed to change, got rid of the old ones, started identifying the cores and started writing a few words into each move. And then took that and I helped like re- angle that in the right direction and then we both work together on finishing the moves mm-hmm. and and then we got to a point at some point where on a seven to nine something on a 10 plus something <laughs> on a 13 plus something else literally written in the move and then we were like okay we got to figure out what these somethings mean i have <laughs> that was our last move and we were both very like we just want to be I done have uh-huh. in that place in pbta design before <laughs> uh-huh like we know the structure, but goodness, what words go in there? Um, I think there's a key. Picking words for things is so hard too. Like, have you sat there with like a thesaurus and been like, "This is not the right word." No, this is not the right word. Like, we're trying to like name a skill or something like that, and it was like an hour of like, what's another word for like technique? Yeah, but when, not when you see. But like, we use that word over here, so we can't use it here. <laughs> Just just wait until you see the attributes and the conditions, uh, because goodness was a, th- a thesaurus absolutely needed for those. Yeah. I think there's a really key thing that we actually might have glossed past in your history, which is, Amar, you just mentioned that there is the, the beta testing, like, public release coming out soon. Oh, yeah. Will you tell us more about that? <laughs> like, when? When will people find it? When can they see it? Uh... The day this episode drops, wow. <laughs> uh, which is going to be Monday, May 3rd. Uh, yeah, we're going to be putting that up on itch.io. Uh, uh, which means if, if you're listening to this right now, unless something has gone horribly, horribly wrong on the back end, <laughs> you can go. Unless I forgot acquire. to edit this episode for us. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, what? Hold on. Wait, back to this again. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, no, that's actually better for us because that means the game will be out long before this episode. That's <laughs> <is> true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 
Um, that will be a version uh, that has that we're calling version 7.75, which has all the stuff you might have seen if you've listened to either Ryan or my Chimera streams mm -hmm. with some more modifications based on what we learned in those streams. And it is the version that we're going to be using today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, before we start using that version today, um, let's real quick go over like terms and things that we need to create characters so that people can follow along with us pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk real quick about the world building part. We've talked a lot about like blending genres and making mm -hmm. characters because that's what we do. But we do love world building on this show. So let's talk about that real quick. What's involved with that? Yeah, so the world building in Chimera uh, is interesting because, uh, and you might see this when we go through it, it has a lot of uh, the the DNA from uh, Descent into Midnight uh, because that was my first non-Chimera PBTA game that I had played. And it it not only was it PBTA and that was new to me, but it was Descent into Midnight, which is... A life-changing experience for anyone. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and the world building in that game heavily influenced the world building here. But in that game, you create the characters first and then infer the world from that. Whereas in, in Chimera, you build the world first and then create characters that fit into that world. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. You pick your genres. And then you pick genre tropes based on uh, what those genres have in them. And we have a list of tropes that you pick from, or you can make your own. And you pick a certain amount of those, and then you blend them together and figure out what that looks like. And, and that's, that's the basic thing that we need to do for world building. There's a lot of questions and stuff involved, but we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, other terminology that might be useful to know is genre we've been throwing around, around a lot and everyone generally has a concept of what a genre is, but it's the sort of big box container for a type of story that Chimera supports, right? Mechanically, it comes with all the pieces you need to build a world and characters and then play the game that might be in that setting or type of story. Mm -hmm. um, it's like your little pre-made Lego set. Yes, yep. exactly. Pretty much. And then if you take multiple Lego sets, you can build new things with them. That's a that's actually a really good analogy. You can have that one. Yep. <laughs> For free. <laughs> I, I don't think we could say that legally uh, due to copyright, but you know. I'm pretty sure you can say it's like a nondescript build nondescript building block. We're the, oh, we're the interlocking building bricks? block. Yeah. yeah, we're the interlocking yeah. building block bricks of RPGs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The kind you don't want to step rolls on. right off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, playbooks. Let's talk about playbooks. I remember when we first recorded our masks series. It was like one of the first. It was this. Well, it was our second series, and it was like our. I think then our second recording too. Mm -hmm. And Ryan kept saying playbooks. They've got to pick playbooks. I had never played a pbta game before and i was like someone explained to me wtf is a playbook <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully by now if listeners have been following along with us for like three years were we at three years four years mm -hmm. three years three years we're, this, we're um, into our fourth they know yep. what a playbook is by now but if they don't if they're just joining us because they were like send us on this episode <laughs> <laughs> well now what is a playbook <laughs> I can't, I'm feeling I can't some pressure Senta's now. Sorry, Senta's been slacking in teaching you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's like Amelia's saying that Senta's slacking in teaching people on what PBTA playbooks right. are. That's what I'm that's hearing what I'm here. Saying, but I have yep. whole episodes uh, about PBTA. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, but they were just like, I like Senta's voice. I don't listen to what she right, says. Right, right. Playbook. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So playbooks in serve the role of classes in PBTA functionally. Right. They are the thing that helps structure what you can do mechanically, what you can advance into mechanically. But unlike more traditional games, play playbooks in PBTA focus more on who you are or what your story is rather than what you do. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like, and that's part of why when we talked earlier about shifting from, say, uh, the standard fantasy classes of like Paladin, we shifted something more towards the Protector because that's the usual role the Paladin is assumed to do. But now we have a playbook that is about that story and you could play it as a Paladin, you could play it as a mage, you could play it as a fighter. 
You could do it as a rogue who just sneaks around and helps protect their friends. You could do it however you want, but that is the set for telling a story about someone whose main goal is to help protect others, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in Chimera, you don't have one, you have two. Yeah, dun, right? dun, dun. That's, that's, the, that's the big part, right? Is you in, in normal games, you just take this one story and that, that's what you work with. In, in Chimera, you when you have the physical sheets, you physically create a playbook by inserting one character type into another and put them together and and you have a book it's i i wish we could do this uh in person because it's it's a, it's a, it's an experience to physically create your playbooks in this game um at, at gen con in 2019 when i showed rich howard this game um rich uh said okay so let's let's get these i've got these different sheets for all the different character types and all that sort of stuff and i said rich I'm about to blow your mind. Let's fold these people. <laughs> He's like, I don't believe you. And he said, and I said, you fold it. You fold the primary this way. You fold the secondary this way. And you insert the secondary into the primary. And the pages line up. And 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 he did it. And as soon as the pages lined up and he had this little booklet in his hand, he was like, what? <laughs> totally see rich doing yeah. that too being like so excited about that it was yeah it was it's fantastic and um the way we did it online is with google sheets you select your primary and secondary and it will automatically create the playbook side by side on your own tab uh which is really cool so basically the the whole thing with chimera is smushing the two playbooks together to get one unique playbook for yourself that's very cool anyone who says that smushing is not a um is not the specific word i will fight them for you just so you know because i probably picked that up from you that's <laughs> exactly the correct smushing word. is a right word smushing is a good word <laughs> i um, tried looking it up in a dictionary once and i'm like what shh, no shh, don't look it up <laughs> uh, everyone knows what we mean i've heard that we have the standard components of a PBTA playbook. Uh, it starts off with your looks, which help structure and guide your thought to thinking about what your character actually looks like. Mm -hmm. Attitudes, which is what we have for stats in this game. Mm -hmm. They describe the way you approach problems rather than specific things about like you physically, etc. Mm -hmm. Abilities and uh, abilities help guide what your character can do in the fiction and how they interact with the world. Uh, they are things like superpowers or what abilities you uh, you have as a fantasy fighter, like what's your skills there, mm -hmm. uh, or what your transformation grants you as a magical girl. Um, relationships and backstory, which are going to be used to flesh out the characters. And then moves, which are your specific mechanical, uh, mechanical tools to affect the story in ways that are unique to your playbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, because... Everyone will have basic moves because this is a Powered by the Apocalypse game. And those are the mechanics that anyone can use. Uh, they are a bit more structured than a role in a traditional game where, you know, in D&D, in &D, you could roll a d20. And no matter what check you're doing, it's one, it's one mechanic. You hit it or you don't hit it, and it happens or it doesn't. In Powered by the Apocalypse, you have different basic moves for different situations that tell you what fighting looks like in this game, what getting information about people looks like in this game. Uh, etc. And those are the basic moves that anyone can use. And your playbook ones are the ones more specific to you. And then we get into uh, signature moves versus the default moves versus additional moves in the playbook. So every single playbook, uh, every single archetype in Chimera has a signature move. Say you have the protector as your primary, you're going to get the primary's signature move right off the bat. But the secondary signature move is locked to you until you advance into it. Um, so it, that's that kind of is what matters. So we'll learn about that more once we get into the actual character uh, building session. But then the default moves are moves that that playbook gets regardless of if it's a primary or secondary. That's like a defining move that could be like uh, the leader for the Magical Girls uh, it, it, their default move is you get a magical companion and this is what you can do with it. Okay. And my horse. I think, th mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think the bound uh, for fantasy uh, has a pact with uh, some sort of entity. Uh, that's its default move, right? So we've got those. And then there's additional moves. Those are the, like, you can pick these as part of character creation. You can advance into them. Um, those moves are also available for picking across playbooks during advancement. So if you advance from your playbook set, maybe you pick select an additional move from another playbook and then you can go out and look at all of those um goodness i don't know how that works in practice when you've got potentially 18 plus uh playbooks to look through it's a lot of playbooks but uh we're, we're gonna try to create a resource that has all of the available moves sorted by genre and then the last mechanic we have uh which won't come up too much during character creation is the fellowship pool. Um, but it might men be mentioned by some of the moves we use. But it is a mechanic in game that you have that you fill up when you do things that bring your team together that you can spend to assist one another on actions and increase the effectiveness of results or roles. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty much the, the weird stuff, I guess, uh, that we would need to know going into character creation. I don't think there's anything else that we need to cover uh that we can't cover during uh character creation all right is it time to do this thing this thing that we've been waiting three years to do <laughs> <laughs> it's it's time we've been talking about it. it's been on our list from day one somebody else has to say say it um i i normally say it and i i can't transition without somebody saying it let's, let's make some people there we go let's make some people I feel like I say it a lot. You do. We got to make All a right. place first. Okay. Well, see, you said to say it, and then I, I said it, and then you were like, not good enough. <laughs> not How about let's, enough. Do it wrong. let's build a world and then it's make fine. some people. <laughs> let's make a place. Don't we have an audio thing for that, too? I'm sure we do. I think we um, do. Let's make a place. Okay. So uh, we have the character sheets that I shared uh, with all of you. Um, it includes the world building uh, worksheet um, as well as the character creation worksheet and all sorts of other fun stuff on here. Um, so we've got to pick our genres. That's the first thing that we need to do. Mm -hmm. And our genres are, as we mentioned before, fantasy, magical girls and superheroes. We have to pick at least two. We can pick three if we like. Uh, perfectly fine. Any which way. I feel like we should stick with two just for the sake of like it really doesn't not being too confusing. It really doesn't matter in terms of the amount of time it takes. Honestly, I, I am with Amelia. I think we should pick two. Um, just okay. Let's keep it neat right. for like people following. Yeah, it might, all it yes. might make it clearer cool. exactly like to see the genres like merge together um, mm -hmm. just for the purposes of shared audio. Yeah. Yes. Um, cool. Well, Ryan and I have picked a yeah, lot. I'm sure you have. I know that feeling, yep. right? Like people are like, well, which one haven't you played? I'm like, I wrote this. I've played all of these 50 times. <laughs> like all different combinations. <laughs> yep. And this is also the hardest part of the game in my experience. So we're going to offload oh, that onto you. Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. As listeners will know, I have zero familiarity with the magical girl genre other than what I have absorbed through Ryan. Mm -hmm. Like, I know nothing about the tropes of it. I know nothing mm -hmm. about any of it. That's the lovely thing about Chimera is we give all of that to you. Right. I'm just saying I don't know that I like am the person to fully appreciate the effort that you've put into mm -hmm. that. Send yeah, probably like, No, on the other hand. <laughs> right. On the other so hand. That's totally fine. <laughs> but but like you know how like some games you're like, I can tell how much love you've put into this because like I can see all of the places mm -hmm. where you've done I will not see all of those places. Mm. Um just, you know, but like, Senda, if you would like to pick Magical Girls, that's totally fine because you will see all of those. Right. Places. I was going to say that actually I wasn't going to force you into Magical Girls. If you prefer to just be that's... fantasy superheroes, we can totally do that. I'm um, happy to. Well, what if we do like Magical Girl superheroes? Okay. I'm good with that. Let's do that. 
Okay. We eat one okay. twenty okay. since we can't do Magical Girl Western. Yet. I know. <laughs> Come I on. Mean, you you could easily do f- Magical Girl Western in a Magical Girl fantasy combo. I think Senda, you and I can write the Western. Yes, we'll just we'll just go on that part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but if, if we want if we want to do Magical Girl superheroes, we can do that. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I just checked the two boxes for Magical Girls and superheroes on the worksheet. Um, and if you go to the genre world tropes page, uh, it unlocked the uh, the tropes for magical girl world tropes and superhero world tropes. So on this page, uh, we've got 10 different tropes, I think. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, we got 10 different tropes for each genre. And we have to select six tropes between these two genres to build our world with. Okay. No. Things that are not in the tropes can still be true about the world. Mm -hmm. The tropes are just the things that most directly influence our world building, the things that we want to see in the palette of our world, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if a trope makes anyone uncomfortable, you can X out the trope. Yep. Um, Go through the list. Actually, Ryan, we should add a column that is X on tropes to this sheet at some point before we release it. Okay. Just as as a note. But uh, yeah, so you can X out tropes that you don't want to see. Mm Mm-hmm. But the way I tend to do it when I facilitate Chimera is each person chooses one trope and then the group chooses the remaining tropes. That way everyone gets at least something they feel excited about. And then there's things that the group as a whole are excited Mm -hmm. about. Okay. So for the audience at home, uh, some of the things that we have uh, on here for the Magical Girl uh, world tropes, uh, one main villain with unlimited themed henchmen uh, is the first one listed. Uh, harmless villains try to avoid killing. Uh, the villains fight amongst themselves as much as they do against the heroes. Um, so those are a few of those tropes. Um, and then superhero, we have uh, super villains are a fairly normal thing. Uh, vigilantism is illegal. Uh, superpowers are rare in the world. Uh, things like more that. Of, most of my favorite superheroes are pillars of their communities and superheroes grapple with the root causes of villainy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good tropes that we can choose from in here. Um, well, I selected the very important trope. <laughs> Costumes are extravagant and identifiable. I mean, the good news is that's <laughs> really true for both of these genres. So <laughs> right. We're in good shape. Um, I think for my choice, just because I think it's interesting from the superhero perspective, I think we should choose the mundane world as mostly oblivious to the goings on of the magical world. Mm, so I think we yeah. have to like hide our superheroing. Yep. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so then let's see. What uh, what do I want on here? Um, who? <laughs> right. What are you thinking, Ryan? I, I've, there's a lot of them that I haven't really seen in play too much um, that I'm kind of leaning towards. Um, but there's also like starting with a hidden base. That's really cool. But I don't know. Um, we'll see. I think. Just follow your heart, Ryan. Yeah. yeah. Just go follow for it. Your heart. You're taking this so much more seriously than you usually. But I shouldn't say that. I feel like usually I'm like this one. And you're like, I don't know. I, you like <laughs> power game character creation, even when we're not playing the game. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to I'm going to play. I'm going to pick uh, your team once lost a teammate to your greatest yes. enemy. Yes. <laughs> uh, which is a magical girl world trope. I'm going to pick from superheroes. Superheroes are pillars of their community. Oh, lovely. Okay, so now we have two more tropes that we want that we need to select. Um, And if we want to talk about them as a group, um, there's a lot of good options left. Can villains have secret layers? I feel like that's important to me. Oh, I'm. I I, I would be cool with that. That seems good. Yeah, I, I really like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be like one of the ones we select. If no, we don't no, want go to, for but it. I do feel yeah. like secret no, layers are, you know, Su- secret okay. layers. We're in on secret layers. Yep. Um, we got the mundane world, mostly oblivious to the magical world. Um, I always love that trope. It's just entertaining. Uh, <laughs> it is. Um, I'm I'm a fan. Uh, of a single focal point connects our mundane lives because I enjoy strange coincidences and okay, yes. stuff like that. Yes, mm-hmm. that's yeah, I awesome. do like that one yeah. too. All right, cool. So let's click on that one. Uh, so I want to make two notes because at this point we have mm-hmm. six tropes. Yep. 
uh, which means we are done. And the rules say you cannot select any of our troop ever again. <laughs> Except you can, because it's your world. If you decide that your world is defined by less things, go ahead. If you want to add more troops, because you're super excited about them, go ahead. We find that six is a decent number for people to start thinking about what the world looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, on top of that, we ended up with a balance of three tropes in each genre. Sometimes you might end up with a lot more imbalanced. I've had sometimes five and one as the distinction between the two genres. And that just means the world by default leans towards more of the conventions of one genre than the other. And that's perfectly fine. Cool. It could change later on once you start playing in it. But that means the group as a whole is telling you they're more interested in those tropes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we've got a pretty even split here. So uh, it, it works out well to to have that. Uh, if we go back to the world building tab now, uh, we can see that our selected tropes are are highlighted up there in the different colors of the genres. Uh, superheroes in red, ventricle girls in teal. In Neptune um, of colors, course. of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Gosh, where could that color have come from? Hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> One day, Ryan's going to wake up and they're all going to be replaced with mercury colors. <laughs> no, I have no regrets. No, I mean, it's, it's fine, but it. no. <laughs> mercury is my second favorite, so it's fine. I, I'm, I'm a mercury fan, but all okay, right. so, moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like, uh, water is fine. Yeah. Um, uh, so now we move on to the questions uh phase of world building uh and we i like to i like to phrase this as we are looking down at the world as a whole and zooming in with each tier of these questions so we get more and more specific as we go um so the first question is what is the shape of this world when you say like that, yeah, I'm like, are we talking about like, like, are we talking about like magicians? How like when they zoom out into space, they're like donuts. This, this is. That? I was this thinking is like, is this Earth or is this like a yes. flat, you know, panel flights riding through space on the back of four elephants on the back of a giant tortoise? Like, right. where, exactly. Okay, good. I'm just making sure that's I'm like the, zooming that's, out. That's, that's some example the, that's answers. <laughs> like literally, I'll get, right? It's literally. the shape of a D12. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, it is. <laughs> okay. If we want a D12 shaped world, we can do that. Um does does um, each face of this D12 um shape like Yeah, I think constitute anything special. E- yeah, one is superheroes, one is magical <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> one is westerns. One I is think no. each of them is like either a landmass or an ocean in its entirety so that it is actually a patchwork of little like uh, however many sides a side on a D12 has, which I suddenly can't yeah, picture. I think it's like a second. Like I think it's like five sided, yeah, right? I'm like, uh, I'm like, this. yeah. D- D12s are uh, a bunch of uh, hexagons. hexagons, six sides. Okay, uh, slapped yeah. together. So, so each hexagon oh, is like. Side. Oh no, hexagon, pentagon. You pentagons. said hexagon, but then you said five sides. I did. I said the wrong <laughs> word. Pentagon. Yeah, they're okay. pentagons. Yeah. So, so each, each pentagon, pentagon, each pentagon on the planet is either all ocean or all all like one it's all one biome each pentagon is oh, a okay. single oh, biome style. we're having I got a it. star oh. wars biome style <laughs> got it got it that's got it that's where i was going yeah. thank no. you amelia yep 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 <laughs> ours is, a, is ours right. a city then yeah like the city we live in the, we city, live in the city pentagon no. uh. <laughs> or is it a suburb the whole pentagon. do we live in the <laughs> suburb biome <laughs> <laughs> so there's only 12 biomes on this Correct, world yeah so there's one city oh. and then there's like one ice cap and then there's like two oceans and then you know like i don't know <laughs> go from there the farm a forest the farm a desert yeah the desert <laughs> and yeah that's it <laughs> like okay. we can okay. find them as we need them <laughs> exactly mm-hmm. um so the nice thing about this question is you can go as big or as small as you want. So yeah. like we had this D12 answer. I've had uh, for Cape and Blade, our answer was we talked about how the world was sky archipelagos and ocean below it. Mm-hmm. And another answer I've seen is it's a mega city. We didn't really care about the entire planet as a whole or what the rest of the world looked like. Our world, the shape of it, was one giant mega city mm-hmm. because that's the part where the story took place. So you can make it as zoom out or zoom in as you want. On, on the same day... Uh, during uh, uh, two different playtests, I had uh, alternate history Chicago 
for both groups that had nothing to do with one another, where if you put the stories that we told in each session back to back, one could have been a precursor story to the other one. And I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> That's amazing. It was wild. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is not a Chicago planet. No. So. no. I mean, unless you count the city Pentagon as... The, the city the Pentagon. The city Pentagon is Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> there you <So>. go. <laughs> Do we, do does this planet have names for these pentagonal uh grid things? That sounds like you're asking me to name something, right? Well, the city one is named um Chicago Kokyo London. Cisco. <laughs> London Cisco. Obviously. It's New Chicago Tokyo Cisco. <laughs> Pretty much like that. See, I'm just curious about how gravity works on the faces. Like if you if you go between the boundary between one of the sides, does like gravity immediately readjust you to the new side? Oh, I don't know. I Ooh. think that that's a cool thing. I feel thing like maybe it does. does. I feel like the edges are like when magnets like like oh, yeah, you just, poles of you, magnets, you know, like <laughs> they don't touch, but then like as soon as you kind of like shift over the edge, then you're fine. I think there's like uh like extreme sports that that ride the yeah, edge. edge walking. Um, yeah. Ooh. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I love, I love just, edge like, walking. Go back and forth like whoop, whoop. <laughs> uh. Oh, colloquially called uh walking the line. Oh. Walking the line. <laughs> uh All right. All right. This is interesting. Um so now that we have that sort of uh thing going, We'll go, get a little bit deeper. What is the typical technology level of this world? What are we looking at here? I'm torn between like far future and like 1984. I really like 1984. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it's 1984. Okay. 1984. Okay. It'll okay. Be I funny. like 1984 as well. Uh, I'm. It's a 1984 level technology. I'm playing technology. a game mm -hmm. that we said in the 1970s, Landlines. and we suddenly last night were like, blah, 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 cell phones, blah, blah, blah. And then the one player who was paying attention was like, um, <laughs> reel it all back, guys. You can't do that. And yep. so anyway, now you have to remember there's no cell phones. <laughs> so that's interesting. So we've got 1984 level of tech. So do we have like giant like batteries for our giant radios that are like 20 pounds and are mm -hmm. like five pound uh, cellular phone that's hooked up to a bag sort right, of deal in the car if you're lucky. going on. Um, yes, I think I mean, I think I think we can also define things a little bit differently because um, I think that's probably standard level of tech for everybody. But for us, as um, if we're in our super slash magical mode we might have things that are also kind of magic or f what feels mm -hmm. like future tech in comparison to what's available to mm -hmm. everybody else still with the 1984 it definitely still has that aesthetic. yeah i'm yeah. like we yeah. we're, we're we're gonna be elite here that's <laughs> we have we have cell phones but the way they work because they don't have a landline attached to them is you plug them into ley lines yes. and then you can communicate through exactly. that wherever yes. you are the ley lines <laughs> Which which run along the edges of the pentagons and then like come into the center, right? Uh, so there are ley lines that some technology uh, hooks into. Yes. Yeah, but magic is not widely right, known exactly. to the world. That's one of our oh. tropes. So, so the world as it knows is is just our world in 1984, but set on a pentagon face of a <laughs> D12 planet. Yeah. Everything else is the same. Obviously. Mm. Obviously. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so ley lines that this magic tech uh, that is available to us heroes and possibly villains, uh, uh, not the general society as a whole. Yes, but but when you hook into it, you still gotta you know go through a blinky green cursor screen and. Is there a ley line switchboard? <laughs> I'm now sure there's there an operator. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I you really have to dial four one one. I really want to know who that. What like what kind of character that operator is? Because that's super fascinating. <laughs> it's my, that's my favorite NPC. We haven't played this game yet, but yeah. Leyline <laughs> operator is my favorite NPC. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit more. Um, how easy is it to travel around, and what modes of transportation are readily available? Rollerblades. Yeah. Ooh. Yep. <laughs> All 
Roller. I, I mean, Thank roller you, skates. Thank you, for just like nodding at yeah. everything that I said. <laughs> roller skates, too. Yeah. Roller skates. And skateboards. Mm-hmm. Could have skateboards. Um... I think it depends what hex you're on, probably, yes, right? Probably uh, really does. Oh, that's that, true. Because that like, if you're in a mountain one, you Pentagon definitely you need a mountain bike. Um, I, yeah. I think we yeah. should just agree, since we can't call them hexes, that we should just call them pence. <laughs> pence. Pence. Okay. Pence. <laughs> pence. Okay, it agrees what there pence you're on. Uh, so in the city pence, I think there's like a lot of infrastructure for travel there, right? Yeah. Um, there's only one city, and so they probably built it with the intent to be the city. So it's got actually good public transport. I know that's that's weird to imagine. If you live anywhere in the United States, <laughs> yeah. it's true. I've mm-hmm. heard places um, have it, though. Yeah, rumor, do. rumor has it. Um, it's got decent public transit. I think one of the more magical ways to travel, uh, building off something earlier, that I don't know if a lot of people know it, know it's magic, it, it's one of the more like publicly known magic, is walking the line. I think you can do some funky things with traveling if you're walking right on the edges of the world. People don't really know it's magic. They just think it's how the world works right. because, I mean, it is how the mm-hmm. world works. But There's a lot of scientific studies trying to sort out the theory of why it works, but nobody's pinned it down yet. Did we figure out which pent we live in? I, I don't think we, li- we have yet. I was, I've been assuming city, but I'm okay. open. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, uh, no, this no, is I interesting. Like city or suburb? Yeah, well, we're, we're we're almost getting into uh, the next question here as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll save my my clarification uh, for that. Uh, is there any other transportation things we wanted to think about here? I mean, I think beyond that, if we stick with you know my half remembered 1984 transportation, like uh, you know, there's cars and boats and airplanes, sweet, sweet boats, yeah. And then, of course, there's slingshotting. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Well, yeah. Slingshotting is where you use the boundaries of the gravities between the tides of the pent to launch yourself across a pent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is it dangerous? If done properly, I think there's a mix. Like, I think there is actual, like, slingshot stations. For the most part, they're used for, like, transport of goods. So, like, if you want to get stuff from the farm yeah. pent to the city pent, you can slingshot it across, like, the ocean And those are, like, clearly in, calculated, like, container. how much, yeah. like, yeah. what's the trajectory? And, okay. and then maybe, like, but a, slingshotting like a is an extreme sport. or something like that gotcha. at the end. Yeah. Yeah. But slingshotting is an extreme sport. Probably very Probably dangerous. Oh, yeah. Very dangerous for, for flesh bags. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can I can see it being like uh, if you go from a certain point uh, along one of the edges to another edge, you could slingshot like yourself from one to the other and be safe if you hit the right spot. Yeah, as long as you and hit it. And that's perfectly. like a super extreme sport. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think anybody's ever been stuck like just like pinballing around? I think that's part of the reason it's oh, an extreme sport. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Because what if you're just like, bouncing forever? Uh, like a forever? multi slingshot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, eventually friction will kick in but I feel like the, one of the first experiments with the slingshot like there was just a crate orbiting the pent for a solid couple of days before it finally <laughs> came down somewhere <laughs> yeah, down. it's just momentum and- uh huh yeah. Is that is that how uh rockets work to get into space? Oh, they just like bounce uh, them up. <laughs> yeah, they bounce them up with the the slingshot uh effect. I feel like that's it's- more of a lateral move than up though, isn't it? I think if you get enough momentum when you're transitioning from one pent to the other, you could just keep going like perpendicularly yeah. to one pent and end up in escape velocity. Yeah. But that probably involves actual well, ha- jet because engines attached to it. Because it, it drops well. off, right? So if you're going up one edge and the next edge is like that, if you keep going straight, you're going right into orbit mm. at that point. Yep. So you could be perpendicular, you could be, you know, parallel to the ground and then orbit the next one if you sleep shot it correctly. Yeah. Okay. So we have na- a lot of 1984 style satellites. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, GPS is just starting, uh, which is strange for a pent. Uh, pent- I don't know what what is a <laughs> what is a D12 do- pentagonal do- pentagonal do- deca, uh, penta- I don't know. Do- do- Twelve. Do- do- penta- do- I don't know. What is it? What is a a. <laughs> Dodecagon is a 12 sided yeah. flat shape. Dode- a 12 isn't that a dodecahedron? Isn't that a dodecahedron? Dode- 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 yep. Questions so we, we didn't go. expect to have to answer today. <laughs> math uh, quiz. Yep. How well do you remember your seventh grade math class? I was homeschooled. All right. I don't um, remember, so. <laughs> 
so we got the the travel methods out of the way. Now, what does the typical civilization look like in this world? Well, uh, I think it depends on what pent you're in, right? It very exactly. much does, yeah. Right. Uh, so my my question was like the ocean pent. Is there a civilization there? Are they uh, underwater? Uh, is oh, that's there... where descent into midnight takes place. Yeah, right. on on the 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 water <laughs> pent. Yeah, the ocean pent. Yeah, yeah. Um, or one of them, because there's probably like a, a warm Caribbean ocean pent, and then like a a cold An Arctic Arctic pent. You know. Um, yeah. Cool. I I think it would be coolest if yes, there was some sort of civilization there. Do you want? Th- I think it would be even coolest just if I didn't have to define what it was. <laughs> okay, um, well, that's fine. I mean, just saying yeah, that it's there um, is enough for, to to expand on in play, right? Yeah, I think that people don't really interact a ton with other, like because because of the way that the the lines are. I mm. think, like, yes, you can travel, but it's sort of like um, scientifically complicated or dangerous, right? It's like I'm, one or the other. I'm giving so a I think very people don't do a lot of like visiting right. i'm getting a very sim city vibe hmm. uh to this whole thing yes. where like <laughs> your your city in sim city is like a square right. of the whatever city. geography <laughs> and there are other things outside of your borders that you never really see but mm-hmm. you can affect one another through trade and and pollution and all that other fun stuff it, yeah. it feels very like each pent is its own thing doing its own thing, and sometimes they'll have interactions with other pens sort of deal. I mean, I think there's a certain amount of, like, you know, food has to be passed around. And, right. like, there are resources that have to be passed around. So there is enough of a relationship between all of the pens. I guess there's some sort of world government managing this. Mm. Because I don't know how else you could make them all, like, mm-hmm. actually function together. Otherwise, like... The ocean could just be like, no more fish for any of you. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. We don't really have like a great world government right now, and we still manage trade okay. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's not like the UN does anything. Yeah, but it's also not like one country exclusively owns the food source for the entire world. Fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which we are Fair. potentially talking about here, right? That's like, true. Right. That's I true. Mean, we did create a farm biome. Yeah, like, if the farm biome pen doesn't feel like sharing with everybody, yikes. That's, that's an issue, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So it has to be a somewhat functional world government. Yeah. To so, so we're talking like maybe like degree. European Union style. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Everybody's opted in. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's on There's board. taxes. This is how it works. Uh, it's slow bureaucracy that doesn't really get anything done, mm-hmm. but it also stops things from getting done. Right. So. And it means that each pent, there's something that they that they actually do and contribute that gives back to the other pent. So, like, maybe in the city, it's the technology, and then they send that back out, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, yes. mm-hmm. so there's Got something. It. They all do something. Okay. There's, uh, there's no just, like, leeches. Except for rock pent. <laughs> 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 well, that's the one that they use for all of the scientific experiments. That's for, like mining and stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah I feel like that's mining. where you get a bunch of natural minerals yeah. from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it generally feels like then we've got a, a system there built on like everyone sharing with one another because of mutual need for what the others can yes. provide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That sounds um, nice. <laughs> yeah. It's it's an interesting uh, world that we're building here. Um, so who populates this world? Uh, typical humans, something else, uh, a mix of multiple types of ancestries. Uh, uh, what what sort of th- uh, beings are we uh, thinking about for the different types of characters that inhabit this world? Okay, so you ever play like an old video game where everyone looked like they were made out of polygons? Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> that, like that's, old not, school that's not a serious answer, but also. <laughs> Like, yeah, no. like how one old my, is well, old to you though? Okay. One of my favorite <laughs> no, 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 I mean, one of my favorite <laughs> PlayStation 1 games uh was Kingsfield. And every it was a 3D uh first person fantasy game, and all of the NPCs were just these blank faced polygons. I immediately thought of um actually Ocarina of Time. So everybody has like the oh, yeah. really pointy noses because you can't round anything out. And, like their <laughs> clothes are like part of them that move yep. with them as solid objects. Yeah. 
Are we polygon people? Uh, are, are we polygon people? I see. I think that like we're all like human, but obviously, like if you've lived in one singular biome for generations and generations and generations, like you would evolve differently, right? Mm. So there's like different, um, like maybe in the ocean biome, uh, humans have gills. Right. Or or like like Gills, slight or like slight web webbing between yeah yeah yeah. Or, yeah 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 okay so it's uh, like human variants okay yeah. that's cool I do like that uh, human variants based on the biome yeah you know because I think it's I think it's easy enough to say that like you know if you live in a place where it's rainy all the time it's okay if you can't tan um, mm-hmm. like. My Irish ancestors, and I'm allergic to the sun. And uh, <laughs> yeah, not you know, look. Some people were not meant to be outside, and it's some true. people are, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I think we can mm-hmm. actually have a lot of fun with it though, because I like gills. But like maybe there's like in the city because they type so much or whatever. Like now they have, they have like longer six fingers? fingers each hand or whatever. Oh! Right? Like, yes. <laughs> 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 Sorry, uh, 1984 technology. Yes. On there, you need yeah. it. The keys are tall. And... I think you've developed an extra finger on one hand for like pushing the thing on the typewriter oh. back. Oh, no. It's only on one <laughs> hand, right? It's How long have we been in 1984 <laughs> technology? Have we just been in 19, like, Eons. we've been in 1984 technology Centuries. for 3,000 well, no years? Competition, so it's, so it's an extra thumb, right? It's not actually an extra finger. You have a thumb on each Ooh, side. Oh, an extra possible like... thumb? Yeah, yeah, please. I feel like I feel like it's a result of like just <laughs> this, the city doesn't. The city never had it does one thing, right? It it just kind of does whatever is needed at the time, whatever processing or research. Or like it's an extra thumb. Is you know more opposable thumbs. thumbs. Those are more good. Those yeah. are never not. Those are adaptable. Yeah. Well, those are adaptable. And then <laughs> and then you've also got uh, the potential uh, because it's all the same species, right? Of having uh, families that are from mixed pens, right? Uh, so mixed pen families uh, can have traits from from uh, multiple pens, possibly. Web thumbs. Gills and thumbs. Yeah, yeah web six <laughs> thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so I, I like that there's there's a potential for a a wide variety of uh, Star Trek esque uh, characters here. Yes, um, which I like <laughs> because we can keep the makeup budget low, right? Like, uh-huh. <laughs> right, yes. right. Yeah, it's like they're all like vaguely human. They're all pretty much just human. Have to, like, sometimes what? they just have forehead ridges, right? And sometimes right. Mm-hmm. they have pointed mm-hmm. ears, and sometimes they have gills, and sometimes they have you know an extra thumb. I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the final question before we get to character creation, um, how are people typically governed in this world and how do normal citizens feel about the government? Uh, so we already kind of touched on this a bit, right? Uh, each pent is self-governed, but then there's a like overarching world government body of sorts. organization. Yeah. So, so how do people feel about this? Uh, and is there anything else that we want to add to it? At all. I feel like it would be really nice if people were, like, pretty okay and the government was doing an, like, okay job. Yeah, that would be a nice I change. I feel like that would be, like, a really nice right. part of, like, my my fantasy role-playing situation mm-hmm. is that it's a competent government that people are okay with. That Yeah, that they understand its limitations. Like <laughs> That's the fantasy world I want to live in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think the way it generally works, then, if we go with something like that, it's it's probably, like, there are representatives who compile information about their pence, right? There are people who are in charge of gathering it all because, like, no one can know what is happening in all of our eleven mm-hmm. pence. So you have groups of people who are responsible for gathering that information, gathering reports on what is needed, what is being output, etc. So the other pence can stay on top of it. But any decisions that affect the pence is done by everyone votes. Everyone in all pence vote to uh, represent their pence. But like efficiently. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think I think we could actually even say so that we know there's an even number of pence, right? Because there are 12. But I think mm-hmm. we could even say like, um, you know, it, it, it actually works well enough that there hasn't been a tie like in the last three generations or something, right? Like people tend to agree mm-hmm. on what needs to be done and then they go do it. And there's no filibusters. And- Especially with... Especially if if technology has kind of progressed throughout the last, you know, 
300 years or so. Um, and we're at 1984 tech standards effectively through that natural progression. People are being more interconnected now. Uh, they're able to have, you know, satellites in space that that allow transmissions to other pens and all that sort of stuff. Um, so having that interconnectedness allows people of the last few generations to kind of uh, come together uh, with that mentality of, we're all helping one another because that's the way this world survives by helping one another. We can't live without the other pens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Okay. Um, that's the basics of world building. Uh, now shall we create some people? Oh gosh. Hey! Let's make some people. <laughs> shall we create some people? <laughs> what am I saying? I'm a guest. I, <laughs> I, I'm allowed it's fine. to mess you can get it wrong. It's true. It's not your show. Stop. Would you like? Would you like me to say a thing now? Sure. You can. You can sub me in. Instead. Yeah. Feel free. Go for it. Let's make some people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make some people. You did it. Did I do it right? You did it. That's perfect. Yay! Oh, um. Look at me hosting. So now <laughs> we can go to the character creation page. So this page we set up to have all the steps that you need uh, for character creation all in one spot. So if we go down this checklist of steps to do, then we've created characters effectively. Um, and what's nice is if you scroll to the right, uh, it has dynamically filled in the different archetypes that are available uh, with descriptions for each of the archetypes. So what we are going to do is each of us are going to pick two archetypes from this list of 12. And we are going to uh, assign one of those archetypes to our primary and one to our secondary. So this is usually the part where I describe what the archetypes are like. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we want, we can go through that. That will probably be better for our audience at home. Probably because they cannot I, see this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to mm -hmm. do you want to just uh, do some alternating or do you want me to cover magical girls yeah. and you hit super? Why don't you do that? Yeah, you do magical. I'll do super. OK, so uh, for uh, magical girls, we've got six different archetypes. Um, if you are fans of Sailor Moon at all, these will sound extraordinarily familiar um, because they were all modeled after the Sailor Scouts. Um, there is the genius. Uh, who is the, the smarty pants that uh, spends time with books and knows a bunch of stuff, um, has a very analytical mind. Uh, the guardian, uh, always the protector. Uh, they'll defend anyone with her without your powers. The heart, uh, this is the heart of the group, always willing to spread love and joy, uh, even if you're a bit selfish about it. Uh, the leader, uh, this is somebody that is destined to lead the group, whether they want to or not. Uh, and you lean on your magical companion for advice. The mask, uh, you follow the group and swoop in at the right times to help. Uh, no one on the team knows your true identities yet. Um, you didn't do anything. We have moves in that playbook for not doing anything. <laughs> for not doing uh -huh. anything? It's fantastic. Oh my god, I might have to play so that. Good. Oh um, and the spirit, uh, which is uh, <laughs> ritual, meditation, guidance, spirituality. This is what you embody, whether transformed or not. So those are the ones that we have for this play test. Yeah. Our goal right now, each genre has got six playbooks for the sake of play testing and making sure the mechanics all work. But eventually we hope to get closer to a full 10 for a lot of the genres that could use it. Some genres might just stick with six mm -hmm. because that works for them. And because, you know, who Sometimes we deserve a break. From that. Uh, but for Superhero 6, uh, for our Super 6 archetypes, if you will, I just came up with that. I'm a genius, but you weren't. No, Love I'm it. Cut Love that it. audio, Ryan. Ryan, cut that audio. Ryan, cut it. We have, for superheroes, the Chosen. You have been chosen by a special focus, which grants you the power to transform yourself into the ideal superhero. Uh, this can range from what comes to mind, like Kira or even Green Lantern, but also you could do for stuff like Iron Man, who have suits of armor that grant them their power, even if it's one they built themselves. The demigod, someone who is born from both a mortal and a literal, or close enough to, a deity. And you are grappling with your obligations to both. These are characters like Hercules, Superman, or if you're, fam if you're familiar with YA, Percy Jackson. Mm -hmm. 
um, or even Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. The hopeful. You weren't born with powers, but somehow you've gained them. Now you choose them to use them. Uh, now you choose to use them responsibly and for good. This is everyone's favorite, Spider-Man. Obviously, <laughs> friendly neighborhood. Friendly neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you could also take it the exact opposite direction. I know that's not hopeful. It might not be the adjective you use when you think of Daredevil, but it is a lot of what his story is about. Uh, and yeah, we also have the innovator. You have innovated your way into the life of a hero. Uh, this can be anyone from Tony Stark again, but also someone like Bruce Banner, who use genius to get his powers, even if his powers aren't tied to that, or uh, Batman. Mm -hmm. And then there's The Stranded. You are from another world, a time, or dimension that is now stuck. Uh, you are from another world, a time, or dimension, and are now stuck on this one with the drive to return home. And this is explicitly about someone who's from somewhere else struggling to go back. So Superman generally doesn't have stories about wanting to go back to Krypton or trying to find his family. Some plot lines are, but not always. So... This is more for someone like Martian Manhunter struggling with his connection to Mars constantly, um, or some iterations of Harbingers like Cable. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you have the weapon. You have been created or trained to excel at combat. These are your Punishers, Black Widow, Green Arrow, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So those are the those are the the twelve we have to work with. Um, you don't have to at this point know mechanically what each character does. Uh, you just have to kind of pick based off of the feel of what sort of story each archetype tells and and then blend it with another one that sounds compelling and then figure it out how, how those work together, uh, which I, I always enjoy seeing. I think you two, uh, Amelia and Senda, should probably pick first. Senda looks like she's like itching to yeah. like say exactly what she <laughs> wants. Have. I have a okay, strong okay. idea, Go for it. right? I have no idea. <laughs> Which I feel like is a weird Do blend. Should, should I just pick one of these players in the list and make it my name? I'm just gonna, so I'm just gonna pop it in them. there. Oh, there! Look, look at you, totally ahead of that. Okay, um, so I think my primary archetype is gonna be the mask <laughs> because I love the idea of this character that like swoops in and just says the right thing to make you be able to do the thing later. <laughs> mask is my favorite one. The mask absolutely so much. favorite. It's just, oh, the idea of just of, of being able to yeah. play with that is uh is is really 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 fun. Um and I think I think what I might do is merge that with the hopeful unless you were after uh, that. No, one, I have no idea what I want to do, um, so. Okay, cool. I'm going to make it the hopeful because um I I I kind of uh I have a little bit of a Captain Marvel mm. obsession based on the movie because I am not a comic book reader. So I am an MCU mm -hmm. girl. Um, and that movie was very powerful to me. So very cool. that feels like oh, the one it. that I'm just going to pull out of there. Hell yeah. Okay. So here's your chance, Ryan. Um, what magical girl thing am I? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, it's a very interesting uh, question. <laughs> Uh, you know, okay, so there are four other archetypes that we don't have included in here, and I know you would be one of them, uh, the Destroyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, please no. tell me more. Okay, like I know that obviously I can't pick it because it's not can't in pick here, it here, but please okay. tell me so more. So the Destroyer is the Sailor Saturn type, which means nothing to you. No. Uh, but this is, mm -hmm. this but is a, a character <laughs> that can, that can literally, that mm -hmm. literally has the power to destroy the universe. If okay. if this character so chose, um, but it, it's it's about struggling with having this mantle of power that uh, you may or may not have chosen, and living up to this like you know you were uh, gifted these for a very specific apocalyptic reason, and you were kind of awoken early. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, not available so not in this that. version. Okay, but anyway, stay I would tuned that. for the That's, next you version. You are right. You are right. But for for this one, um, I can I can kind of see, uh, maybe the guardian working for you. Okay. Um, oddly enough, the heart, the heart would work for you as well. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I could see that. Um, let's see here. I mean, there's also the leader. Uh, the leader would uh could could potentially work for you as well. Um, gosh, uh, your, your organizational skills would translate well to the genius. 
Okay, so really any of them now is what you I said mean, at this point. Right. Yeah, really any of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta pick. Sorry, I didn't, didn't really help, help at all. This but honestly, like, there's one that's not here that would <laughs> totally be you. Yeah, I would but. say between the Guardian and the Heart, yeah. uh, probably. All right. I gotta pick a superhero one, too. You now, can pick two while I'm choosing. Yeah. I don't know what I want. Now, so that's one thing to-, to, to keep in mind. You don't have to cross the genres either. You could pick two magical girls or you could pick two superhero types. Oh. Um, I liked crossing genres because that was the fun, like, let's yeah. mix it up that I was going for here. But that is cool. So if you were more specifically interested in just mm-hmm. one or the other, and could be like, no, I'm only yeah. in superhero and genres. And if you're leaning into the magical girls, like, completely, you could be two magical girl types and just just go wild with it. I am assuming that once an archetype is chosen, nobody Correct. else can choose that. Is yep. that yeah. Gen- generally the rule? Yeah, I mean, again... Rules are made to be broken. If you at your table want to have two of the same archetype, you can. But sure. I had a feeling you were going to choose Demigod. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with Demigod. But the guy, the De- guy Demigod is like <laughs> the powerhouse uh, character archetype. And then I'm going to go with the leader. Ooh, I like it. I do love nice. being in charge. Yeah. Goodness gracious. I'm going to, I I have to choose a uh, a magical girl archetype. Otherwise, what am I even doing here? Why are you, why are you even There's, here? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is like, it's <laughs> like literally my game? whole stick. I'm like, should I do two <laughs> uh, superhero archetypes? I, I find know, it man. funny, though, that magical girl was not the genre you started with. I think I just assumed it was because <laughs> I knew that. It was one of the ones you had, and how could it not be where you started? I, there was a point in uh, in development where I said, "Why not magical girls?" Uh, I mean, and I just and I just I created mean, it. Really? So <laughs> why yeah. not me, man? Why Why yeah, I mean, do I have to limit myself to two genres? This is silly. No, you don't. And that was our first <laughs> yep. mistake. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm gonna go with the spirit. I think. Uh, Mainly because I, th- it's it's one of my favorite signature moves um, that we have. So I'm going to choose that. I'm, I'm in the wrong one here. I think I'm in row eight. There we go. And I think I'm going to take that as my primary. Okay. Um. Ooh. And I'm going to go stranded for okay. my secondary. Shocked. Ooh. Cool. So I think to showcase a little bit more, I'll go with double superhero. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. Um, so I will take the innovator as my primary and the weapon as my secondary. Oh, nice. Very cool. Call to action. Yeah, like that. I am consistently blown away by the ideas for worlds and characters that people come up with for this game. And this session was no different. A D12 shaped world with unique gravitational effects along the edges is so good i can't wait until you all hear the next episode until i let you go and get to those credits and show blurbs we have just a quick couple call to action items to leave you with first i wanted to personally thank everyone who left ratings and reviews on pod chaser last month uh, we were very grateful to read them and are happy to have been able to add just a little bit to the Meals on Wheels fund for the Reviews for Good campaign that they had in the month of April. I really hope that they keep it up next year. Uh, It would be really awesome to see more reviews pour in uh, at that time as well. Second, we are in the last day or so of the Blue Planet Kickstarter. They passed almost all of their stretch goals with only three remaining. So it'd be really great to see if we can get them all the way there. Finally, Chimera releases to the public today as a fully playable playtest. You can head to play.chimera.games to get yourself a copy today. There are also community copies available, no questions asked. If you are down on your luck or just want to try it out, Uh, or check it out, you can go and get a copy for free if there's one available. Um, For every $15 the project earns, we will add another copy to the stack. So any tips that you leave will add up with any other tips that anyone else leaves, uh, and every $15 will add another copy. And that just gives another person another chance to find the game for free. If you did grab a community copy, you can always go back and return it. 
uh, by buying the game itself and allowing another person to grab a free copy later. So again, it's on the honor system, but uh, I really like the way that the itch EO itch.io community uh, has figured out a way to allow people to to have free access to these games uh, if they if they are in need of it. So definitely go check that out. That's all of our announcements for now. Thank you so much for listening. And please join us on the next episode where we finish creating our characters as well as add to some world building in the process. Until then, take care, everyone, stay safe, and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like A Woman with Hollow Eyes. A Woman with Hollow Eyes is a podcast adaptation of One Shot's live stream dramatic Invisible Sun actual play. Discover a world of magic, secrets, and supernatural civic disputes in our unique take on Saturine. In the first season, James D'Amato, Cat Cool, and SNL writer Alan Linnick are led on a mind-bending adventure by GM Darcy Ross. Even if you already saw the streams, you want to listen to this podcast for the incredible soundtrack, composed and edited by Will Levendahl. Get it by searching for A Woman with Hollow Eyes or Darcy Ross on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app.